All right. Now, we want to welcome everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to this week's Future Trends Forum. This is a special forum for a couple of reasons, and I'm delighted to see all of you here. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to say, join me in congratulating us on celebrating four years of the Future Trends Forum. We started this off in 2016. Uh, we have had more than 200 programs since. We have thousands of people who participated, an enormous amount of people who have followed us as guests or as people through Twitter. And I just want to say congratulations to everyone. It's a delight to have been working with you for four years. Woo! Now, let me get into introducing this week's program. Uh, so, first of all, you should know the Future Trends Forum is a discussion-based program. We have conversations here about the future of education. It's all about discussion. What I'm doing right now, showing you slides, will only last for a minute. The idea here is to have ideas, topics, reflections, arguments, and support all across all these different venues. Now, the Future Trends Forum is part of an ongoing project called the Future of Education Observatory. And that's a multimedia, multimodal attempt to grapple with the future of higher education. That includes this forum. It also includes a blog, a book club, the monthly FTTE report. If you'd like to learn more about that, just head to futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. Now, we can only do this work with the support of some sponsors and other supporters, and I'd like to thank them before we start. To begin with, I want to thank NYSERNET in New York State. Uh, this is a nonprofit that does fantastic work connecting that state's colleges and universities to broadband internet. They also do great professional development work, and we're delighted to have them as a supporter. We're also grateful to our supporters in Shindig, because as you can see, they make this technology that we're using right now. So let me just walk you through it so you can see how it works. Where I am right now, and where the slide is, again, just for a minute, is called the stage. And we call it that because everybody can see and hear everything that goes on up here. This is where I'll be for the hour. This is where our guests will be in just a minute. And this is where you can be. And I'll show you how to do that. Right below us, you can see a bunch of different people, maybe up to 20 at a time. Each of them is represented by a single image, and it may be a video feed, so you can see Roxanne Riskin, or you may be a, a photo or a silhouette like Christine Wolf. Um, each of those represents one person, maybe a couple more, signing in from somewhere on the Earth's surface. Now, that group will move and change as we go along. And if you want to have contact, personal contact with anyone in that group, just double click on them and you'll have a few options for that. But how can we have this discussion that I was talking about? Look at the bottom of the screen. You'll see different, a few different buttons lined up. One of them is a chat box. And if you press that, you'll have a, just a, be able to chat with everybody who's here. So if you haven't done that already, just click on the text chat and say hello to uh, everybody who uh, is here. Say hi and say where you're from. So you can say, for example, uh, what state you're in or what country. Now, if you want to talk to everybody else, there are two major options to know about. First, you'll see a question mark, and next to that, you'll see a raised hand. If you press the question mark, you'll be able to type in a text question, and I'll read that out loud for everybody to hear, and then I'll flash it on the screen so everyone can see it as well. That's pretty effective. People often do that if they're having bandwidth issues or if they uh, uh, are in a hurry or if they aren't in a place where they can actually speak out loud. But if you have a video, if you're in a place where you can do that, press the raised hand button. That tells us that you want to join us up here on stage. And that's pretty nifty because then everyone can see and hear you. You can have a face-to-face -face conversation. In fact, we can have up to four people here at a time. So we can have a kind of pop-up DIY panel of conversation. So if that's not enough, if you're a Twitter user and you want to use Twitter and tweet at us, please just use the hashtag FTTE or Tweet at me, Brian Alexander, and we'll be glad to have your conversation there. So those are a few different ways to participate, a few different ways to participate in this conversation about the future of education. We're grateful to Shindig for making the technology available. 
We're also grateful to our supporters on Patreon. Uh, Patreon is a crowdfunding site where people collaboratively fund a project that's ongoing. In this case, they fund the Future of Education Observatory and are working it. So people contribute as little as a dollar a month to keep all the machines running and the lights on. And I want to thank people who contribute even more. These folks here contribute more than $10 a month. Folks like Steve Ehrman, Trent Batson, Laura Armour, Colleen Carmi, Jeff McClurkin, Chris Neshelman, Melissa Wu. They're really, really grateful people. We're grateful to them for being such great people. And you can join them. Just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. We'd love to have you. So, by the way, one further note, if you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, my new book, Academia Next, has finally appeared. Here's a visual aid for it. And you can grab this from Amazon or from Johns Hopkins University Press. It's about the future of education, and it draws heavily on our work here for the past four years. So, that's all the introduction that we have to have for the program. Now, let me introduce our fine guests. We have two people, Lene Erickson and Robert Kelchum. Lene is at Third Way, where she researches policy, including education policy. Uh, Robert Kelchum is a professor at Seton Hall who researches higher education. And both of them uh, have been working very, very hard on a lot of interesting questions involving uh, where higher education is headed. And what's interesting is the two of them have just had a kind of debate about where Congress should intervene to try to help graduation rates. And this debate really covers an awful lot of ground. So let me bring them one up after the other. First, let me start off with uh, Lene Erickson. And let me bring her up on stage like so. Greetings. Hello. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm really, really glad to see you. Thank you for making the time. Um, it just you know, to introduce you, let, let me ask a couple of things. First of all, where are you today? I'm in the swamp of Washington, D.C. today. Um, I'm on the road. To give people a sense of what you do, what you're going to be working on for the next uh, 12 months. What are the big topics, the big projects that will be up in there for you? Well, I work on a whole variety of policy issues, including higher education, but in our higher ed work, we're really focused on trying to get Congress to pass federal policies that would improve student outcomes. We think that a lot of federal policy around higher education has focused on getting students into college, not necessarily getting them to successfully complete it or go on to the success that we hope that college promises. So uh, maybe we'll see some actual movement this year. Um, it's one of those issues that's a little less partisan than some of the others that I work on, like immigration or LGBT rights. And so I still have hope that Congress might act this year. Well, very good. Besides that enormous issue, what are some of the other uh, policy issues that are uh, most uh, demanding of your attention for the next year? Well, I'm spending a lot of time uh, analyzing the 2020 race, uh, first with the Democratic primary and then in the general election. So that's kind of all encompassing this week. Um, and then I, I do work a lot on immigration reform and um, how we can um, talk about immigration in a way that brings Americans together rather than dividing them, which I think is, is what's happening in too many circles now. So yeah. I do a lot of public opinion research to try to understand how people think about immigration and, and how we could kind of move forward on that issue. Oh, fantastic. Um, if you can figure out what happened in Iowa, please let us know. <laughs> um, let me, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you're here. Um, I'm in awe of your policy work and um, I'm really excited. And let, let me uh, just add to you, let me, um, we have Robert Kelchin from Seton Hall. Hello, Robert. Oh, your uh, audio is off. Yes, you're, you're muted right now. So if you, okay, how about now? All right, can you hear yeah. me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, the, it had to reset it. Understood, understood. Well, it's good to see you here, Professor Kelchin. Glad to be here. Well, let, let me ask to introduce you to everybody. What are you going to be working on for the next uh, 12 months or so? What are the big topics and projects that are uppermost in your mind? So I'm spending a lot of time looking at how states fund public colleges. And a lot of states tie a portion of their funding to student outcomes. Mm -hmm. And then also looking at the federal policy landscape. And one of the big things that's happening now is 
more information on outcomes at the program level and thinking about what that might mean for future higher education act reauthorization. Oh, excellent. Excellent. When do you think we're going to get around to reauthorizing the higher education? Act? Well, I was saying for years that I'd probably get tenure before that happened. I got tenure. So now <laughs> I'm going to say I might retire before that happened what? because <laughs> I, I think we're looking at a few years still. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, um, your, uh, your description of your work on state funding really feeds into this. Um, now, if friends, if you haven't had a chance to read these articles, you can look in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. There should be two buttons. I'll give you links to this. Um, and if I could just to um, both of you wrote kind of a pro-con article about this idea of tying federal support to college and university graduation rates. If I just ask the two of you, how did this question arise? How I mean, did did the uh, did the website approach you um, with this idea, or was this something that just you both came up with on your own? What's the backstory? They, it, for me, they definitely approached me. They said, we need somebody to write in defense of using completion rates and uh, of all of the kind of accountability policies that we work on. Um, this is the one that has the fewest people that will go on record to defend it, I think. And so <laughs> they came, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of other folks who are out there on things like debt to earnings, you know, um, things like some version of, you um, cohort default rate or repayment rate, looking at outcomes in general, but completion is is one that's pretty dicey. And so uh, they asked me to jump into the fray and I knew uh, it might be that no one else would. So I decided to uh, spend some time writing a 2000 word essay on it. Uh, which, is, which is terrific. Um, hey, Robert, how did you get involved in this then? Yeah, they, they asked me to write a piece on this. And usually whenever, someone calls to write a piece or a reporter calls for a quote, they basically expect me to be the skeptic on everything. <laughs> so that's the role that I end up playing here. Ha, huh. ha, huh. oh, that's interesting. Oh, that, that says so much. Um, so it's interesting. So you get to be the skeptic and uh, Lene, you get to be the, if I remember rightly from your biographical page on the Third Way site, you get to weigh in gleefully on contentious topics. That's right. <laughs> oh, terrific. Um, Friends, I, I have all kinds of questions for our two experts, but I want to make sure that you have time and comfort in asking your questions of these two. So let me just ask a couple of quick ones just to get the ball rolling, to get the ideas out in the open, and then please either click the raised hand button to join us on stage or type in the, uh, uh, type in the uh, question mark button so that you can share us some, some of your thoughts and comments. We had a slightly ironic one on Twitter right now, which Robert, I think you in particular will appreciate. Um, one uh, person said, I would love to make it, but I got to do a bunch of attendance reporting to justify the support we get from the feds. Uh, our, our good friend returned to Title IV. Mm -hmm. That faculty have to fill out and staff have to fill out documents saying that students attended at some point during the semester after the ad drop date. Right. And good luck getting faculty to do this because they don't understand why in most cases. That's really hard. You get Do you have to play that role at uh, Seton Hall yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm department chair, so I have to make sure that these things get done. But I mean, at least for me, I know why it's happening, so I, I do it. But it's hard to get people to do things that they don't understand why they're doing it. Well, let's let's dive into the why. And uh, uh, Lene, if I, if I can start with you. Um, your article talks about the urgency of tying federal funding uh, or some form of federal oversight to graduation. It's because you point out that on the one hand, our national goal seems to be to increase as much throughput through higher education as possible. Get as many students, as many people from America to graduate with some degree, you know, everything from associate's to PhD. But you point out that our graduation rates are actually abysmal. Uh, I think at one point you say we graduate that 10%, 15% of students actually succeed in graduating? Well, it's about 50% overall, but there are lots of federally funded universities that graduate one in 10 right. of the students that enter. So that, that, that gives you a sense of crisis and, and urgency. And you say, this is where, car, and given the, especially the huge investment that the federal government makes, that the federal government should step up. Um, what, what would this look like? What would this, uh, what would this kind of tie between federal funding and graduation rates look like? 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, just to, to punctuate the crisis, I think the uh, federal government has been so focused on access, on getting people into any kind of higher education. But what we didn't realize was, especially because our system is often funded by loans, we're asking people to take out debt, mm -hmm. um, we could actually be leaving them worse off. If they get walk through the door, they take out a bunch of loans, right. they don't actually finish their degree, and they can't ever pay those loans back, the students are in a worse position. The federal government's not getting the the return on its investment. So really, it it um, you know could be to the detriment of all of us if we are completely agnostic as to whether or not someone graduates once they sign up for college. Mm. Uh, so and and that's where I think we are now. Right now, we basically are agnostic as to whether someone completes in in federal policy. Um, but there are lots of ways you could go about fixing that. And you could go really, really heavy handed, for example, say all of your funding, you only are going to get this money if this student actually graduates. That would be like the extreme, right? I think there'd be a lot of bad impacts of that, including, you know, passing students that shouldn't be passing, um, you know, moving students into shorter programs that they can complete more quickly and then you can get your money. There's all kinds of, of um, ill intended consequences there. But there are other things you could do. For example, say uh, there is a bottom line um, that if you don't graduate, say 10% of the students that enter, maybe you're not doing a particularly good job at educating them. And so, uh, you know, the federal government could say, let's let's look at ones that are below a really minimum rate of graduation. You could also say accreditors should look at this because accreditors are supposed to be looking at a subjective lens for, you know, is this school actually providing value to the student? And um, so it wouldn't need to be a bright line. They could take into account completion rates. Right now they don't. Um, and so, you know, you could do something like that. You could also invest in some of these evidence-based um, programs that we've seen really increase in completion rates. So um, things like wraparound services, um, you know, programs that are looking towards completion from the very first moment a student gets on campus. We could fund those programs more and then that would in turn hopefully increase completion rates at, at you know, the places that are serving the students we care the most about. Um, so there's a whole range of policy options. I think some of them are are could be bad policies and we need to make sure not to overcorrect, but that we should start thinking about what the options might be. Thank you. I really appreciate that. That's a whole set of many options. Um, well, um, Robert, you're the skeptic, and uh, and and you're you're to be fair, your piece wasn't entitled "Why This Is a Bad Idea." Uh, <laughs> your your piece was about this being um, a mixed policy, or so far the results have been mixed. Yeah. You want to dive into some of the problems as well as some of the ways this could work? Sure. So first thing in response to Lene that accreditors at least are starting to look at colleges with low graduation rates. The regional accreditors that get most traditional four-year and two-year colleges do put more scrutiny on colleges with graduation rates below 15 to 25 percent. So there is something happening there. It's pretty small. But my skepticism comes in that even if a portion of funding is tied directly to outcomes, evidence from these state policies shows that colleges are trying to do things like restrict access to college or get people into shorter term programs. They may try to make programs easier, but that's something that's really hard to get at empirically. Mm -hmm. And the other issue here is, is there a political will to close down low performing institutions? Because looking at the traditional graduation rates, some of the lowest performing institutions are community colleges where students come in and out or transfer to four-year institutions. Also, minority-serving institutions yep. often have low completion rates. And there is no way that Congress has the political will to close down those types of institutions. Now, with that being said, is it possible to tie a small portion of federal funding to outcomes? Maybe. States have done this and states have basically said the only way colleges are getting more money is if some is tied to student outcomes. But at the federal level, we just don't have that history yet. And that's why it's hard to make that kind of shift. I see what you mean. Um, so it's tricky to do this. Um, and and the, state, the state experience so far doesn't exactly um, 
give us a lot of enthusiasm for it. Um, well, I would say, you know, Robert said it this way, which is that the results are mixed. I mean, I think what we've seen from the states is there are lots of different ways to design um, incentives in this structure. Mm -hmm. And there are some that are very bad and have had bad outcomes. And, you know, we can kind of see what's happening there. So, for example, um, we don't want to create a structure. Um, we have a. Uh... Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we have a, a comment uh, from Jeff Alderson at MathWorks. It was corollary to your question about federal incentives for data collection analytics. The federal program for state longitudinal data systems, uh, giving money to states to link K-12 to, to higher education and workforce. And I think he needs to follow up with that. Um, Jeff, if you want to uh, add a second point to that. In fact, he actually wants to join us on stage. So, uh, Jeff, let's see if we can get your camera working. Um, and you can join us. Let's see. Jeff. Hey. <laughs> so I was listening into this um, to that to that discussion with with bated breath a little bit because so part of my background in education technology is I was involved in setting up a lot of those state longitudinal data systems and there was a lot of federal money that was thrown at that and I don't know what the scorecard was. I think over forty five states eventually implemented some form of connection between K-12 higher ed and workforce. And I haven't heard a lot about that recently. Um, there were a lot of federal agencies like the, and, and campaigns like the data quality campaign that sprung up to take, you know, to try to get the word out about why you would link data sets to look at completion across these boundaries, these traditional boundaries. Um, there were even some state compacts like the Southern Regional Education Board and others that were trying to share data amongst these sort of consortia because these state data systems didn't really cross state boundaries very well. And, and I remember some stories about how even Louisiana and Texas had to struggle to try to share data amongst their systems because they had these weird, you know, laws and restrictions in terms of what they could actually um, share. Um, and that was about the same time that the you mentioned that Congress came out and sort of legislated the, in, uh, you know, an inability to share data across these boundaries. I haven't heard a lot about it since then. Maybe it's because I'm not so close to that to that um, part of the, the industry anymore. But uh, I'd be curious as to if you think, if you've heard any examples or any anything about where there's some success stories coming out of there that you know that people are talking about how they've used those systems in present day. 